Welcome to the EVO Institute for Jewish Research virtually. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs of EVO. Um, and we're delighted to have you here with us today for this webinar celebrating the new translation of Franz Kafka's Diaries um, with Ross Benjamin, translator. And this conversation will be led by our own Jonathan Brent. Before I hand it over to them when we get started, just a very brief word about EVO. Um, we're a very special place for the celebration and contemplation of Jewish history and Jewish culture. We have a library and an archive, which are used by researchers from around the world, um, which contains over 23 million documents and over 400,000 books. Um, and we bring to, the, to life this world of Jewish history and Jewish culture through our public programs, through our exhibitions, through a variety of classes. Um, and we're thrilled to have you here with us um, as we do that today. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Jonathan and Ross. Thanks so much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, welcome, Ross. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's delightful to have you back at Evo, Ross, and uh, I just uh, want to uh, say a few words about you um, uh, for our audience. Uh, Ross Benjamin's translations include Friedrich Hilderlin's Hyperion, Joseph Roth's Job, and Daniel Kelman's You Should Have Left It Until He Was Awarded the 2010 Helen and Kurt Wolf Translators prize for its rendering of Michael Mars speak Nabokov, and he received the Guggenheim Fellowship for his work on Franz Kafka's diaries. Uh, the translation of Job, I want to particularly mention, I have used it in classes. It's superb. Uh, it renders the, the Jewish idiom uh, with great nuance. And we're very, very fortunate to have you with us today to talk about uh, Kafka, uh, in which the Jewish uh, idiom is also very nuanced and, and very problematic and very interesting and a, a, a real challenge, it seems to me. And so I want to spend some of our time talking about that. Um, and get your thoughts, but I wanted I wanted just to start, if you don't mind, uh, by reading the last entry, which to me is incredibly powerful, and I think kind of sets up much of what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the hour. Uh, this is from 1923. Uh, December, I guess. Is it December? August. It might have been June, because I remember thinking it was almost exactly a year before he died. Right, right, right. Yeah. See. Yeah, June, June 12th, yeah. 1923. Yeah. More and more anxious while writing. It is understandable. Every word twisted in the hands of the spirits, this flourish of the hand is their characteristic movement, becomes a spear turned against the speaker. A remark like this most especially, and so on to infinity. The consolation would be only, it happens whether you want it or not. And what you want helps only imperceptibly little. More than consolation is, you too have weapons. So I want to talk today about those spears and the weapons that Kafka had uh, that challenged them. And of course, he was the possessor of both the spears and mm -hmm. the weapons. But uh, before we get started, I, I just do want to hold this up. Uh, this is the book and it is published by Shocken Books. And I urge everyone who has an interest in Kafka, in Jewish literature, in, in modern literature, to get a copy of it. It's without question, the, well, it is the most complete, the only complete, and the most, uh, the, the most uh, thoughtfully translated, I believe, of all of the editions that are published. Thanks so much. So to begin with, Ross, I'd really just like to get your thoughts about those spears and those weapons, what you think about that and how those are revealed in the diary. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, first I, what always moves me when I read that written a year before his death, 
we don't know when he wrote the letter that he wrote um, instructing his closest friend Max Brod to burn all of his unpublished writings and to let his other writings kind of fade, his published writings fade into obscurity. But I always read this, whether or not it was what he had on his mind when he wrote it, I always read it with that in mind, with when he says, you two have weapons, talking maybe, you know, mostly to himself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think of his kind of uh, final testament um, to extinguish the words that had that were always turned against him uh, as spears. Uh, and I, I find it moving in that light, whether or not we don't know what he was thinking when he was thinking about those weapons. Um, mm -hmm. But the entirety of the diary is one of his abiding preoccupations. And in a way, if there is a through line through this really heterogeneous and rather disorganized complex text that is his diaries, um, it is his struggle with writing and with his form, mode of creative expression uh, being literature and his sense of whether or not literature was fulfilling what he needed it to fulfill for him or whether he was fulfilling what he needed to fulfill through literature and this mistrust of words or his doubts about um, his own writing are surely a through line through the diaries. And in, if the diaries have a dramatic arc, it's kind of his um, attempts to um, um, achieve his aspirations, whatever they are, and we can discuss that with writing. And uh, for many, for the uh, you know first half of the diaries almost, we watch as he tries again and again uh, to write things in the diaries, to write literary pieces in the diaries and um, breaks off and fails and um, reproaches himself for his abortive attempts and for his inability to um, uh, uh, fulfill what, what his wishes are for his writing. And then this moment in, the, uh, in 1912 when in the midst of his diary writing, the short story, The Judgment, basically bursts into being and he writes it in a single sitting within the diaries, feels incredible elation and ecstasy and a sense of this, only in this way should writing be done in this cohesive way um, where the entire um, work of art is accomplished in one um, continuous uh, sweep of inspiration. And, uh, uh, and then really the rest of the diaries we watch that disintegrate again, that cohesiveness. And we watch him again, try to recapture that moment and mostly abandon uh, unfinished things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so there's much else going on in the diaries. And we're gonna talk about a lot of it besides this kind of uh, drama with his writing, but it's fitting that they should end with a note of, um, there's a lot of despair in that final entry about um, uh, words and about their, um, betrayal of him uh, um, and then there's some kind of consolation or at least he testifies to a consolation or something that's more than consolation that he too has weapons. You know, but, you know what yeah. I thought of when I read it because mm -hmm. the diary, there's so much in the diary that is so such excruciating self, uh, I think Dostoevsky's term is self laceration. That's a good term for that. You know, everything. He gets down to every dirty detail of his life. Uh, the man that he sees. At one point, I, he calls it like the rat hole of ulterior motives. Yes. Yeah. And so I was thinking those spears are like the glass needles in the machine in uh, the penal colony, in which yeah. the writing is, in a way, inscribed on him on his body. Yeah, and that image comes up not only throughout the diaries, but through uh, his whole corpus, um, not to pun on corpus and the body, but the um, image of uh, sharp objects meeting human flesh, usually living flesh, mm -hmm. is a really versatile image that he deploys again and again, like as part of his repertoire uh, through the diaries and the letters and repurposes for all different, sometimes comical, uh, um, uses like uh, the, the, there's this moment that I often refer to to characterize his diaries and their um, literary quality, the way in which in the diaries he's always 
shaping his distinctive um, literary sensibility and idiom. He's not just recording what happened that day, though he does that too. But, and I always point out this passage where he's talking about the headache he has, and he doesn't just write, you know, I had a bad headache today. He starts describing the headache as an inner leprosy, and it reminds him of the skull cross sections and textbooks. And it's almost like a painless dissection while alive. And then he describes the dissecting knife um, sliding over, you know, <laughs> he, he talks about how it's um, slicing thin membranes, even finer, very close to working brain parts. And uh, that knife slicing living flesh comes up in letters. He writes to Felis, who was to be his twice fiance, uh, twice broken off engagements. Um, in an early letter, he writes to her about um, his desire to be the piece of wood that the cook braces against her knee and um, slices off thin cross sections of the wood. Um, <laughs> to feed the fire. And he says those, those would be somewhere around the area of my thigh where she's, where she's slicing. And he speaks of this as a wish or a, or a longing to be this piece of wood being sliced um, by this female cook. And then in a letter to Max Brode, a little later, he, he turns the feeding of the fire to the feeding of a dog. And he says, uh, oh, the longing to lie down on the floor sliced up like a roast and pushed one of the pieces of meat to a dog in the corner. So this self, just uh, dramatizing this uh, meeting of sharp object and flesh is something that he um, was doing with a, so I think with a self-conscious kind of literary intent throughout mm -hmm. his life. It was obviously a preoccupying image, one of those images that really compelled him and and irresistible. Yeah. Yeah, there is also that extraordinary section about, I think it's his cousin's circumcision. Mm -hmm. uh, his nephew, I think. His nephew his yeah. nephew and um you know I, I i just wonder whether this cutting this jabbing this piercing may also have something to do with inscribing the covenant on the body in the right the sense of things being carved into flesh that yeah. comes so uh becomes so manifest in, in the penal colony with that transgression being inscribed into the body of the condemned man um yeah. and then later the officer yeah that uh, it definitely resonates with that tradition. Other scholars have also um, mined or drawn, you know, sometimes overstated probably, uh, the relationship of this type of imagery of self-butchery to the fact that I think Kafka's grandfather, maybe it was a great grandfather, was a kosher butcher who is very mm. considered a holy man. And, and so the, being just a generation or two removed from uh, traditional Judaism and the kosher butcher, and he's Kafka is a vegetarian, of course. So, so all of these images being meat of, you know, there's another really telling one that speaks to a theme that comes up again and again in the diaries about the, the being feeling divided between his office life and his desire to devote himself entirely to literature. He's working mm -hmm. in a social insurance institute, partially state-run workers' accident insurance, which again involves a lot of um, petitions about workers' bodies being maimed and mangled by machines and metal, um, uh, not to mention a vast bureaucracy. But this, he's writing, a, he's drafting a, um, what was it I was gonna say about the office life? Oh, he's, he's uh, dictating a memo in the office to like a, some administrative agency. And he senses, he can't think of a word and he uses all of his powers to come up with a word. The word happens to be stigmatized which also can't be found anywhere in the office writing. So it's possible he's also embellishing a little here for effect because stigmatize is such a evocative word in this context. And then he says how he's like misused his literary powers for the sake of this bureaucratic document. And it's like he's robbed his body of a piece of its flesh and he can taste the meat in his mouth of that piece of his flesh uh, of the word that, and there's this disgust of like having meat in his mouth that connects with his vegetarianism. It's all over, over interpretable, but, um, yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah. So this, this preoccupation um, with his, with, with his, the, the physical pain and, and, and the self-infliction of it, I, I, there really isn't a precedent in Jewish, in the Jewish tradition that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For kind of uh, it certainly history. doesn't come from Sholem Aleichem. It doesn't come from <laughs> parrots. It doesn't come from 
from uh, uh, Mendel, uh, you know, where does it come from? It, it clearly comes out of a combination of his lived experience and his other, you know, imaginative experience. Mm -hmm. And that's of his own body, I think, too, as his own body, uh, sickly and ailing long before he had tuberculosis. She was diagnosed with in 1917 and died of at the age of 40, uh, 1924. He always describes himself as being sick and ailing and having all these symptoms, these sort of nonspecific symptoms, insomnia and constipation and headaches. Uh, there's that was just one of many. Uh, poetic descriptions of headaches. There's a headache that's like having two boards screwed into his temples. There's all sorts of descriptions of headaches, of, of digestive complaints and ailments. And um, so the sense of his body as somehow being afflicted, um, he certainly drew on that for his imaginative description. And in a way, and we'll talk more about this, it, it starts to make it difficult to actually pin down how bad his bodily complaints really were or how much they were kind of occasions for literary embellishment and dramatization because you know was the headache really that bad or was it that harrowing or did he start coming up with harrowing images that he then could reuse in his fiction and elsewhere yeah great so this kind of jumps to uh something that I did want to talk about which is a lot of people read his literature through what they think was his life relationship with the father, his tuberculosis, and so on and so forth. What you're suggesting is that it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, the way I, I read it is it's not quite the opposite, but it makes it kind of um, impossible to determine or decide, um, and maybe somewhat less salient, whether something is biographical or, or is an act of literary imagination. Because mm -hmm. I think my impression is that most of the time Kafka was eager to do the latter, to turn something into an act of literary imagination. When he was setting pen to page, his desire in sitting down to write, whether it was in his diaries or to write a letter or to write a, no you know, a, a novel that would remain unfinished or to write a short story, or aphorisms for that matter. Whenever he sat down to write, I think he was hoping to write the judgment, to have a great experience of externalizing what he called the tremendous world I have in my head, or in another passage, he calls it his dreamlike inner life. Mm -hmm. So as soon as he could, or as soon as he kind of hit his stride, I think he was often involved in elaborating a literary persona or um, expressing something in the most, you know, imaginative way possible. And so, yeah, the biographical value becomes inseparable for me fr from that act of literary self-creation in a way that also then calls into question whether we can really say, um, well, here, this is his personal writing, it's his private diary. And I could be more specific and concrete about that because there are diary entries, especially early on in 1911, mm -hmm. a whole sequence of diary entries that he decided to extract from his diaries and publish as prose pieces in literary journals, just changing some of the names to initials and making some other minor tweaks, um, and then ultimately collected in his first uh, collection of short prose called Contemplation, also been translated as Meditation, the Trachtung. Um, those were, they began life as diary entries, and we cannot know for sure whether he was just writing a diary entry, say there's a famous one about the noise in his apartment, um, and it's clearly poetic and funny and dramatizing uh, being disturbed by all the different noises at his apartment. It's clearly some kind of you know, literary exercise at least, but it's a, it turns out to be a fully formed literary piece when he takes out of the diaries and publishes it. Did he begin with the intention, I'm gonna write a literary piece? Did he at some point realize, oh, this diary entry is working out pretty well, maybe I'll publish it one day? Or did he only read back through his diaries later looking for material and, so we can't decide was it you know was it ever a purely private intimate moment of writing or was it always a potentially literary moment and I tend to lean toward the latter it's just my impression that you know um, anything that achieved a certain level of 
um, satisfaction for him as a literary piece, whether he wrote it in a diary or a letter or elsewhere, um, would then appear in that form, you know, in his mm -hmm. lifetime. Um, and the rest of it, you know, was consigned to the flames. And so we can't know how he would have either used or or not used it. Um, um, so yeah, that that is kind of where I I also find it more exciting, right? Like we wouldn't be interested in Kafka's private life if it wasn't transformed with this poetic intensity into something suggestive and evocative like his literary writing. Mm -hmm. But it, it also in a way makes sense, right? That, that his imagination would uh, on the one hand uh, structure the literature, but on the other hand, it structured his moment to moment experience as well. Right, right, yeah, it, it becomes kind of just a continuum. Um, and, you know, to add to uh, the way we approach the diaries or to add sort of information about the way that might inform the way we approach the diaries, he was hyper aware of literary diaries as a genre. And within the diaries themselves, there are moments where he talks about reading Goethe's diaries and how that he speaks explicitly about what it feels like to, to, to keep a diary while reading Goethe's diaries. Right. Um, just as now we might try to keep a diary as a writer and feel like we're in the shadow of Kafka's diaries, you know, um, and many literary diarists are certainly thinking about posterity and, you know, Kafka's decision to have all his work burned, we know by the end of his life, that's what he wanted, but it's not at all clear and doesn't even really make sense that he wasn't thinking about posterity at all while he, when he began his diaries. And in fact, he, at other points in the diaries talks about uh, planning to read some portions of them to his friend Max Brode, his later literary executor, uh, on the New Year's Eve. He ends up not reading them, but he's talking about leafing back through them, looking for good passages to read. He reads to his sisters from the diaries, like he sees them as a source of text that he might present to an audience. Mm -hmm. And then at, almost toward the end of the diaries, in the last notebook, there's an entry where he says, just handed over all the diaries to M. And M was Milena Yasenska, his first translator and his Czech translator, who he also had a love affair with, a mostly epistolary love affair in letters. Um, uh, she was a married woman. And uh, um, in the early 20s, he handed over, he gave her all his previous uh, 11 notebooks and ripped out the pages of the notebook in which he then wrote the entry, just handed over all the diaries to M and gave all that to her. And that's actually the only reason these are published as diaries um, is because he called them in the text themselves as diaries and he in a self-contained way gave her those notebooks and not other notebooks that are resist classification you know and are a mix of different types of writing yeah so, but just, that's all to say that at least then at that moment very late he had at least an audience of one um, so the sort of the theatricality self, the performativity and self-dramatization in the diaries the kind of comic art of fetching throughout the diaries um, like there's more of, there's more performativity in it than you might expect if you saw it as a purely private enterprise. Um, that would give us kind of the um, hidden intimate thoughts of Kafka. There's a great intimacy to it, but it wasn't necessarily um, to be shielded from view. Um, by the end of his life, of course, we weren't ever supposed to see it. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a performative aspect uh, throughout all of his work actually, you know, yeah. uh, in, in the metamorphosis, the mother and father play the role of the poor person, uh, uh, the, the end of the trial is the, the two assassins appear to be old, old vaudevillians. Right, uh, like extras. Right. And uh, yeah, there is this very important element throughout uh, of putting on a show. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, it's fascinating. So the, the diaries, you call them diaries, but it's really sort of like Schwitter's Meersbau, in which everything gets stuffed together in this uh, one growing structure. Yeah, uh, that, it's, that it's has, very unsystematic, yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and again, yeah. suggests that Kafka, while writing, was always, um, uh, open to 
ending up somewhere other than where he started like uh, or also just grabbing writing materials and mm -hmm. <laughs> not caring how to classify them because he wasn't organizing his papers for posterity right um, and and the way that you've published it here gives the reader for the first time an understanding of this sort of organic uh somewhat haphazard structure absolutely to yeah to this body of whatever you want to call it because uh, bra uh, broad uh made it very logical yeah yeah he made it sequential and cohesive yes where kafka might begin a literary piece and then break it off and try again and break it off and try again, sometimes dozens of times, try again from the middle, maybe here's a little piece of the ending. You know, now I'm gonna write the same scene in six different iterations with some variations and take it in new directions. And so what you have in my version based on a later German edition is a kind of scrap heap of abandoned attempts. Broad would just take those of, those scraps that he could stitch together into a composite and uh, fabricate basically one integrated whole. Uh, and that would be like, it would look more like one cohesive unfinished story that's right. otherwise continuous. And then he'd abandon the rest of the fragments. Mm -hmm. So it appeared far less fractured and far more, um, far closer to a finished work. And he formalized the language and he corrected misspellings and uh, smoothed over syntactical clumsiness. And all of that led to this, um, misrepresentation of the diaries that uh, Broad published, Broad prepared the German edition in the late 40s and then it was translated into English in 1948 to 49 based on Broad's um, editorially um, um, uh, sort of intrusively altered version. And, and then what he found personally unfit for public scrutiny, he censored. So he cut a lot of more lascivious sexual stuff and homoerotic portions and um, uh, anything he thought reflected poorly on Kafka or that came into conflict with a certain image of Kafka that Broad was wedded to as a saintly figure who, whose purity shouldn't be tarnished by more bodily or um, uh, all too human foibles yeah. and flaws, yeah. Uh, Shanda, Shanda for the great. <laughs> Um, do you think that the diaries, do you think this is the reason Kafka wanted uh, everything burned? Do you think the diaries give us an insight into that? I think probably um, he would have, I mean, this is purely my fantasy, but mm -hmm. I feel like he would have been fine with the homoerotic stuff, with broad cut like references to the flatulence of, you know, to farting. I think Kafka would have been fine with the farting. Uh, I, I don't think Kafka was intent on presenting himself as a pure saint the way Broad was. I think Kafka didn't want, wouldn't have wanted his misspellings and his technical imperfections out there. He didn't even want, he wasn't even satisfied with the metamorphosis, you know. Uh, in his diaries, he says the ending was a failure because he had um, had to go on a business trip for two weeks in, be in between writing the first two thirds and writing the ending. And so he never was able to uh, get back to that, whatever the initial vision had been. He was never able to realize to his satisfaction. In the diaries, he's still writing alternate endings to In the Penal Colony after it's been published, you know, during his lifetime. So there's several alternate endings uh, that also, you know, don't, aren't necessarily complete. Um, so we ha he was perpetually dissatisfied with um, his literary output. And I think that was at the heart of his desire to have everything burned, not personal re revelations about, I don't think he really tried to present himself as particularly pure or um, saintly or as this literary monk in the way that became important for a certain image of him after his death. Um, but I do think he was, and Broad knew just as well that he was such a stringent perfectionist that he was, um, misapprehending the importance of his own work. I think we all agree that, you know, the trial, the castle, America uh, should not have been burned, nor should the metamorphosis, the judgment and things he published in his lifetime have remained in obscurity or have faded into obscurity. 
but they're uh, some of the most groundbreaking visionary works of modern literature. And Kafka himself thought all of it was insufficient, inadequate, and ought to be forgotten. Um, so Broad recognized that he was too harsh a critic of his own work. Uh, so I think, yeah. No, I just, uh, we're, 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 we have about 10, 15 minutes left and I, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I can't, I can't let this go without talking about his fascination for Yiddish theater, yeah. Yiddish language, the jargon, as he refers to it, uh, mm -hmm. as also did Sholem Aleichem and others. But uh, I'd like to sort of put this uh, under the uh, heading of did he see himself as a Jewish writer, as a German writer? What kind I, of, what, how did he see himself? So why don't, you, yeah. why don't you first talk a little bit about his fascination with the Yiddish theater right. and essentially pulp fiction. Yeah, so in 1911, a traveling Yiddish theater comes to Prague from Lemberg, uh, Lvov today. Uh, Lemberg in, um, and uh, the actors are from Warsaw, I think. Um, and uh, um, Kafka then spends pages and pages of the diaries summarizing their plays, describing the actors and actresses. He um, uh, develops crushes on a number of the actresses, almost like schoolboy crushes, very, uh, these kind of infatuations with these married um, women. He um, befriends particularly uh, an actor named Yitzhak Lurvi, um, about whom uh, Ivy Singer has a story called The Friend of Kafka, because later on he can understand why Kafka was so interested in these shabby Warsaw actors um, who are now going around saying, oh, I'm a friend of Kafka's. And when uh, Singer finally reads the diaries, he's like, he, he had this crush on Madame Chisik, who was, you know, she's not she's not really much to write home about. Um, but yeah, um, he was uh, uh, deeply fascinated by these actors and by the Eastern European Jewish life that uh, Lovi was able to describe to him in great detail. He kind of debriefed him about the Jewish life in Warsaw and he has a whole entry, you know, describing the yeshiva that begins like yeshivas are Talmudic schools, you know, it, it, it's kind of his self-education in um, a Jewish world that in his generation of German-speaking Prague Jews is he's removed from by really one generation. It's like his father and mother grew up in a milieu more like that and have now uh, assimilated as kind of uh, middle-class um, Jews who, who, who in his view at least are just going through the motions of going to temple four times a year. And um, you know, a lot of this comes up in the letter he wrote to his father late in life, um, reproaching his father for all of his father's reproaches of him. And one of his father's reproaches of him was insufficient Judaism. And he said, well, you know, I would, I didn't understand why I had to go to Hebrew school when you seemed so indifferent at Temple, and it was just an exercise in learning by rote. You know, his father announced his bar mitzvah as a um, as a uh, confirmation in the Prague newspaper uh, as a testament to his sort of assimilationist tendency. And um, there's a famous line by Kafka that maybe encapsulates both his um, reproach of the Prague Jews, the assimilated sort of middle class. Prague Jews of his father's generation and his interest in um, the Yiddish theater, which was, um, he said, uh, the German speaking Prague Jews of his generation, uh, their hind legs are still stuck in the mire of their father's Judaism, while with the four legs, they uh, flail, failing to find new ground, something like that. It's a paraphrase. Um, so he felt they were in this transitional moment. Um, and his father, uh, he says, even in the letter to his father, he says, then finally, around this time that's recorded in the diaries, 1911, when I did become interested in the Yiddish theater and in Judaism through that route, you were disdainful and contemptuous of my friends from the theater because they were, there was a, kind of a um, sort of uh, snobbery or prejudice of Western European, especially German speaking, you know, um, uh, Jews toward their um, counterparts from the East uh, who came from a more impoverished chateau milieu and were considered backwards and were thought to inflame the anti-Semitism. Um, so his father, there's another moment, I'm jumping all around, but there's a moment in the diaries where they're 
uh, Kafka and Broad are volunteering for a relief effort for Galician ref refugees in Prague. And uh, Broad's mother um, sort of sneers at one of the um, refugees for taking too long to pick out a dress um, um, uh, when she should be just grateful, you know? And then the refugee sort of schools Broad's mother by saying something like, a mitzvah is worth far more than all these shmatas or something like that. Um, so it, there's this sense that um, of a generational shift that that there's something inadequate about the parental assimilation, um, and yet there's no way to go back to the generation before that's immersed. And um, the Yiddish theater is a kind of entry point. You know, the other for his generation, Zionism was another one. He had a, a lot of his close friends, including Broad. Um, were really active in the Zionist movement, um, but that he tends to register with more ironic distance than he does the Yiddish actors' less, less immediate um, affinity. So, you know, he has a passage in the diaries, oh, all these travelers to Palestine come, come back and here's how they, here are the gestures they make in their zealotry. It's more his move, his distancing move where he pays a lot of attention to people's um, bodies and how they um, betray their um, yeah, I could just trail off here because there's so many, there's so much richness to it, uh, his longing for Yiddish, for Yiddish literature. I think you asked what, how he sees himself. Does he see himself as a Jewish writer or a German writer? I think in a certain sense, he feels um, uh, uh, like being a German writer, German language writer is um, something he has to overcome or that he's kind of um, burdened by it when he writes these passages that have become justly famous in the diaries about small literatures, reflecting on the Czech literature of, you know, uh, um, that's, that's similar to the, um, the Czech literature of that time is, is also caught up in the sense of uh, Czech identity becoming solidified as a national identity, you know. Um, uh, and then Yiddish literature, as he's learned about it from Livy, he seems to be longing for these small literatures and the possibilities that they give to writers to um, forge new paths and feeling himself burdened by a literature in which he's in the shadow of giants like Goethe or, um, um, but I read those passages as very much locating himself outside of the small literatures looking in um, mm -hmm. and longing for that um, kind of vibrant self creation that's possible. Um, and idealizing them, of course, because there were already figures who were um, titans in, in Yiddish literature um, that he was only just getting to learn about at that time. Uh, I yeah. wonder, uh, we're, we're really kind of at the end of our discussion. I'd like to open this up to questions. Right. But before we do, I would like you to read this one extraordinary passage about his mother mm -hmm. that brings so much of these things together. It's um, uh, Again, I believe this is after, like, just after his first encounters with the Yiddish liter with the Yiddish theater. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's definitely after yes, a whole sequence of true. diary passages that are um, all about the Yiddish theater. Yeah. So it's sort of in the wake of this discovery. Sorry about that bang. Um, it's October twenty fourth, nineteen eleven. Uh, my mother works all day is merry and sad as the case may be without making the slightest fuss about her own states, her voice is bright, too loud for ordinary speaking, but beneficial when one is sad and after some time suddenly hears it. For a long time, I've been complaining that I am always ill, but never have a particular illness that would force me to lie down in bed. This wish surely goes back for the most part to the fact that I know how comforting my mother can be when, for example, she comes from the illuminated living room into the dimness of the sick room or in the evening when the day begins to turn uniformly into night, returns from the shop and with her worries and rapid instructions makes the already so late day begin again and encourages the sick one to help her with this. I would wish for this again because then I would be weak, therefore convinced by everything my mother would do and with ages more distinct ability to enjoy could have childlike pleasures. Yesterday, it occurred to me that I have not always loved my mother as much as she deserved and as I could, only because the German language hindered me from doing so. The Jewish mother is no mutter. The designation mutter makes her a little odd. 
not itself because we are in Germany. We give a Jewish woman the name German Mutter, but forget the contradiction that sinks all the more heavily into the feeling. Mutter is particularly German for the Jew. It unconsciously contains, besides the Christian splendor, Christian coldness too. The Jewish woman who is called Mutter therefore becomes not only odd, but also foreign. Mama would be a better name, if only one didn't imagine Mutter behind it. I believe that only memories of the ghetto preserve the Jewish family, for the word Fatter too is far from meaning the Jewish father. Tremendous, tremendous piece of writing. Um, anyway, uh, let's uh, let's hear what our uh, listeners uh, want to ask. And Alex, would you please uh, yes questions to pose? Thanks. Yes, and so if you have any questions, um, I see some have been noted in the chat. I'll try to get to them. But if you could put them in the Q and A function, that helps us make sure that we don't miss them. And I also see that some viewers have their hand raised, um, but you'll want to put it, your questions in the Q&A function. And before we dive in, I also wanna just say, I neglected to note at the top of the program that this was co-sponsored by the new Lair House. And so we're grateful to them for helping us spread the word and for partnering with us. Um, okay, so you talked about um, the kind of idea of the Ostjuden um, that's reflected in some of these uh, discussions. Does the topic of anti-Semitism come up in any of these diary entries? It's a good question. Um, he doesn't spend a lot of time explicitly talking about anti-Semitism, so it would have to be read in. Um, I mean, I read it into that very uh, complex of the Eastern and the Western Jewish attitudes uh, because uh, he, he talks about his father denigrating his Yiddish actor friend, Lurvi, um, by saying, uh, Basically, uh, if, if you go to bed with dogs, you wake up with fleas. And I thought that Kafka is aware while he's writing that, that his father is reproducing anti-Semitic comparisons of Jews to insects and animals, ones that would be very present in Kafka's own fiction where you know a man turns into an insect or when the protagonist of the trial is executed, he says, like a dog. And Kafka uses animals a lot as stand-ins for um, uh, the type of pariahdom or um, abjection that that can be read as um, the experience of Jews under anti-Semitism. And so uh, in that moment, I think he's um, condemning his father for making those sorts of comments about Louis. Um And then I think he implicates himself in some similar attitudes um, in a way that Broad felt compelled to cut in one of Broad's moments of censorship when Kafka goes to the theater with Lurvi, um, there's a moment where Kafka talks about, um, first he says, Lurvi confessed his gonorrhea to me. And Broad cut that for one reason or another. I think he cut most venereal diseases in the diaries. Um, and then he says, um, <clears throat> I got nervous when I um, leaned over and my head touched his due to the possibility of lice. And Broad cut that, and I, I believe it was because Kafka was implicating himself in the sorts of attitudes that he's otherwise um, able to accuse his father of. And that's often um, a dynamic I noticed when I tried to figure out, well, why did Broad cut this and not this? It was often a place where Kafka was no longer at a loftier height judging um, uh, the flaws of others, but was implicating himself. And uh, so, uh, but whether, uh, you know, I think the idea of Christian anti-Semitism or the anti-Semitism of the world around him is almost um, a, a tacit assumption in places, but he doesn't address it explicitly, or at least it's not coming to me now, a place where he addresses it explicitly or extensively in the diaries. Do we know precisely why um, he stopped writing his diaries in June, 1923? I mean, biographically, he was dying. Um, he was working a lot in his last um, uh, phase of his illness. He was working a lot on trying to finalize the manuscript of his final collection of short stories, A Hunger Artist and Other Stories. And by the time he died, he had you know, corrected the second pass proofs of that collection, which was published in the months after he died, uh, just a couple months after his death. So. 
uh, I think it was just um, having limited ability to, um, you know, he had to husband his, his energies in order to finish that last collection. And that's what he was focused on. And he wasn't writing as many um, diary entries at that point. There's an interesting section where he's not writing diaries between 1917 and 1919, where he was writing these other notebooks that had been published separately as the Blue Octavo notebooks and um, do seem different in quality from the diaries. Like they're mostly consist of um, aphorisms that are almost like these um, philosophical riddles. And uh, while he was working on that project and in a different size color notebook, because that's what Blue Octavo means, the diaries, these diaries were written in um, brown quarto notebooks. Um, and during that time, he wrote very little in his diaries. And then when he came back to his diaries in the 20s, it was, he was writing a lot more of those sorts of aphorisms in the diaries too. Um, but other than that, I don't have much yet to go on on why the diaries stuff. I, I suspect it's simply that, yeah. Okay, very interesting. Um, you spoke about his encounter with, you know, Yiddish theater um, personalities, and you talked a lot about the, you know, the relationship with these um, Eastern European Jews themselves. Um, was there an encounter with the literature, with, um, uh, you know, the dramatic work that you could speak about? Yeah, I mean, he writes a lot about the plays themselves. Um, uh, so the dramatic work for sure. And then he prepared a, um, and it's an amazing document worth reading. Uh, there are translations of it. He prepared an introduction on Yiddish or on jargon as he called it. Um, and that's something I kept. I didn't translate jargon as Yiddish, but because he could have said Yiddish, he said jargon. Um, he prepared this lecture as an introduction to a series of recitations that Lurvi gave of Yiddish poetry. And in preparing the, the lecture, he read um, a history of Yiddish uh, theater and literature that was written in French. I think it was the only standard work on the subject. Um, and he takes notes on that in the diary. So the diaries contain just excerpts uh, in French and of his paraphrases and translations of the French from this uh, L'Histoire, I'm going to mangle it, but it's judeo aleman you know, Jewish, German, uh, or Yiddish, this history of Yiddish by um, Pines. And in there, you see him, the, the, the dates and the names and the lit and the works that were key works in Yiddish literature. And then um, the, the piece itself that he presented, that he actually delivered this lecture, um, is fascinating for, he's addressing a German audience, um, probably mostly German speaking Jews, on why they shouldn't um, feel uh, uncomfortable or why, how they can understand the Yiddish if they just get over certain hangups they have about Yiddish. And um, he's really celebrating the language in a way that's elevating it far above what you would call a jargon, even as he continues to call it a jargon, um, and making interesting suggestions about the relationship between German and Yiddish. Like he says, German is the only language that Yiddish can't be translated into. Because when you translate it into German, it just disappears in the affinities, the cognates, you know? So he says, like, I don't know if I have the Yiddish words right, but he says, like, Blut is in Bloit and Tot is in Tut or whatever, you know? Uh, death and blood, which are suggestive choices to a vocabulary. But he says the German, they found this almost the same, the German words and the Yiddish words for death and blood. And so in that similarity, you would actually lose what's so different about the two languages. Um, so he says, you know, don't translate it into German. Um, but yeah, there's a lot in that. It's a very, very rich um, encounter. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's similar in a way to the the passage that you were reading about Mutter and versus Mama. Um, yeah, there's kind of nuances that that are very hard to capture. Um, yeah, wonderful. Um, another viewer is asking about Kafka's legacy um, and and his influence on other writers. Um, perhaps specifically the diary, you know, you spoke about how he was a reader of, of literary diaries. Um, do you think that his diaries have left a mark on uh, future writers? Or perhaps you could also speak about probably if you'd like. Yeah, I'm sure they have. His work more broadly has left so many marks that it would be impossible to give an exhaustive, you know, it's, it's almost, uh, there's almost too many um, whole movements have kind of adopted Kafka as their patron saint and then, you know, found that he couldn't be subsumed in their own narrower framework, um, like, say, existentialism. Um, uh, Sartre, Camus, obviously, were deeply influenced by Kafka um, and sort of adopted him, but, you know, obviously he also can't belong to that it's anachronistic to assimilate him to that movement, uh, or um, a lot of science fiction writers, Ballard and 
you know, it's, it's just the influence is so um, pervasive. Uh, movies like, I don't know, Terry Gilliam movies, Brazil. I'm just whatever springing to mind right now. I'm just blurting out, even though it could have been a dozen other things. Uh, the diaries, I'm sure, also influenced literary diarists. I remember when I was 16 and posturing in my own diaries, I was, you know, trying to mimic Kafka's um, the style in, in the old translation, but you, know, you still get the overall sense of it, trying to copy. Okay, I believe Anais Nin uh, talks in her diaries about Kafka's diaries, um, uh, Susan Sontag's diaries. Um, I can't imagine that, you know, in her um, writing diaries that she wasn't, she didn't have other literary diaries, including Kafka's in mind. Um, um, yeah, so. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, another viewer is asking, following up on um, Jonathan's question, could you talk about Kafka's love of adventure novels and his interest in relationship to uh, his interest of far-flung places? Yeah, well, there's a, you know, there's, I have so many scholarly books here. I feel bad highlighting just one, but there's this book, Kafka's Travels, uh, that really extensively goes over that. You know, a lot of stuff I can touch on has been uh, really extensively documented by the Kafkaologists, uh, not to use that in a derogatory way like Pindera did, but the you know, scholars who've, who've really mined it. Um, but so, yeah, he read in particular this series called The Little Green Books, uh, Schaffens, I think, Little Green Books. Uh, they're often uh, in the end notes, there are a thousand over, there's like 1200 something end notes, maybe 1400. Let me see. I want to get it right because. Um, in this, uh, in my translation of the diaries, based on the German editions and notes with some additions, some adaptation, 1,403 end notes. And, you know, a lot of them go to these, um, not a lot of them, but it comes up again and again that he's read these um, uh, little green books, which were often about um, kind of colonial expeditions and adventures, um, tales of you know, Indians or of indigenous peoples of different continents and um, um, clearly fed into his writings about um, particularly the report to an academy um, where uh, an ape is captured somewhere on the Gold Coast and um, brought to Europe and civilized and, uh, you know, civilized and um, in order to survive has to adopt all kinds of human, um, uh, has to kind of assimilate um, uh, and, and that was published, in fact, in a Zionist, in Martin, Martin Buber's um, magazine. Um, so there's a, definitely a Jewish connection to his interest in colonialism and in sort of the civilizing rhetorics and so on. But also he read, as, as Jonathan started to allude to, he was interested in low as well as high literature and theater. And the Yiddish theater interested him in part for its shabbiness and imperfection. He's always talking about seeing like the you know dressing room through the curtain and or seeing a quarrel between the actors um, um, and uh, the the bad sets and the imperfect the, the you know things that make no sense in the plays that are maybe just because someone forgot their lines or extras that are clearly like their wigs are falling off or they're giggling behind the scenes or whatever like he he liked these kinds of um, cracks in the sort of aesthetic. Um, uh, edifice that, um, in a way, you know, I tried to capture my translation of the diaries too, but he was interested in, uh, uh, and he drew from all of these, you know, he drew a lot from the Yiddish plays. There's clear, uh, you could trace direct lineages of certain Kafka characters to characters he describes from the plays, like the assistants in um, the castle resemble so much these two, um, uh, he calls them the two characters of captains um, in one of the plays that uh, Der Meshomid um, and, uh, and gestures and sort of types of theatrical humor and physical comedy that happen in the plays um, and the physical description that he does in the diaries of those actors and then the physical description in his works. Um, so he, he found, uh, let's call it like low, like pulp literature or theater to be also a fertile source of inspiration for his own work, um, including those adventure and colonial um, figures, yeah. Um, Ross, if, if I may, I, I, I'm not sure that we have more questions from our listeners. So I have something um, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, much of Kafka's work is unfinished. I didn't realize that he didn't feel that um, 
the metamorphosis was unfinished. Right. Uh, that comes as something of a surprise to me, I have to say. But the castle is not finished. Uh, America is not finished. Uh, there is an unfinished feeling somehow. Yeah. Uh, and of course, one could say that this is because his life was cut short mm -hmm. uh, and he died before his time and before he could do it. Or there was something in him that didn't want to complete, didn't want to finish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the trial, I guess, is also, you might say, a it is, yeah. He wrote an ending, but he didn't write the chapters in between. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, I wonder what your thoughts are about this and the extent to which the diary helps us understand this, which I think is an important element of our reading of Kafka. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, uh, most of these unfinished works he did abandon in his lifetime before he died. Like he was not, it wasn't like he was working on them up until he died and then he just died. Um, of course, he knew he was uh, getting sick and had to decide what he would work on and what he wouldn't. But a lot of these, he, aban he mostly, he abandoned America, the trial and the castle, all after coming up, after hitting some kind of wall in the creative process and feeling that he couldn't achieve what he wanted to achieve. And that happened again and again with pieces in the diaries where he's writing something and you think like, oh, this is, this story is amazing. I wish I could see where it goes, but he breaks it off and says, oh, it's wretched. You know, there's nothing real in it. There's nothing true in it, nothing pure. And you you can't see how it wouldn't have been as good as many of the published works if he just kept going. Um, I mean, for, I think retrospectively, the unfinished nature of his work is thrilling and captivating. Like it's, it makes the, it, and seems, does seem to reveal something essential about what he was doing as a writer. Um, exploring these questions and tensions and conflicts that really are unresolvable. And so how could you really conclude the process of mining the most um, kind of difficult dilemmas of, uh, and struggles of um, uh, say modern existence or just of, you know, sometimes of the human condition? Um, how could you really um, tie that up in a, in a tidy way? Um, it makes sense from, you know, or from a retrospective perspective that um, there was this flux and instability to all of his work. And for me, translating the diaries, being particularly attuned to that instability and to that um, open-endedness and provisionality of the diaries um, uh, really opens up all the work for me. Like I, there's, you can make a distinction between like, uh, there's a scholar called Gerhard Neumann who makes a distinction between Kafka's Werk you know, the cohesive finished works that he prepared for publication in his lifetime, such as the Metamorphosis and his shrift, his writing, which was all the posthumous stuff that uh, was writing, but wasn't ever um, polished by him and finished. But I see the distinction just collapsing in moments like that, where he um, expresses his dissatisfaction with the ending of the Metamorphosis, or even just thinking about, uh, there's a distinction between like an open work of art and a closed work of art, and I think, you know, from our contemporary perspective, it's clear that even closed works of art are open, right? If you go back and want to translate um, Bobble's Red Cavalry, you have to decide which Red Cavalry you're going to yeah, translate. Exactly. Um, yeah, so it's just, uh, you know, he revised it for new editions. Uh, he censored parts. Was, or was he cutting that part just to satisfy an audience or a political regime? You know, uh, uh, there are the manuscript versions. And you know, uh, and it all becomes much more fluid when the closer you look at it. And so that was kind of the project, obviously, of the diaries was to get so close to the text that um, these sorts of categories wouldn't um, hold, and that it would be open again for whatever avenues we want to um, that we're tempted to follow. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting though when when you think about uh, Kafka's place in popular imagination we say it's Kafka-esque. It's yeah. like Kafka. It's a Kafka bureaucracy. It's as if there is a very crystallized uh, uh, thing that is Kafka. Yeah, we think we, it's like, it's as if we think we know what Kafka was all about. Exactly. And of course, and, uh, the irony is that he's one he of the 
listeners to know what he's all about. Uh, and that's kind of, yeah, that's a, a lot of what I find appealing about him, of course, is how he escapes these yeah. uh, oversimplistic uh, or reductive right. um, ways of knowing him, including Broad's own, you know, version um, and many of the versions of others. It's not just how he escapes them, but also how he endlessly produces them, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Jewish Kafka, of course, there's so much to be said about the Jewish themes in his work. That's not like a... Um, a laughable misapprehension or something to see Jewishness everywhere in his work. But of course it can, there's no skeleton key, whether Jewishness or anything else that can yes. unlock all of the work. And so it's it's the endless reinvention that becomes um, possible if we don't get stuck in any of these, in, in like the idea of the Kafkaesque being somehow explanatory for Kafka or say existentialism, you know, it's, it's the graven images that we um, are forbidden to. <laughs> To worship, yeah. Um, well, unfortunately, on that note, I think we have to wrap things up. Uh, this has been a wonderful hour with you, Ross, and thank you so much. Thank for you so much. I really enjoyed it. Making these diaries available uh, in the form in which I think they add something really substantial to uh, not just the content, the particulars of what we can say Kafka did, thought, felt, et cetera, but to the shape of his life, mm -hmm. the, the inner life that he mm -hmm. had, that was also unfinished. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Ross.